But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, slash gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there simply is no law. There are no objections. There is no condemnation. Thank you. You may be seated. God's spiritual fruit basket. The melon of meekness. God's spiritual fruit basket. The melon of meekness. Let us pray. Father, open our eyes now that we might see, our ears that we might hear, and our hearts that we might receive what your word has to say. There is strength in meekness. There is humility and teachability in meekness. There is consideration in meekness, O oh God. And there is beauty in a meek and quiet spirit. Let us, Lord, live our lives with this kind of an attitude that you may be glorified, your people may be edified, and lost sinners may be evangelized. It's in Christ's name and for his sake we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God's spiritual fruit basket. The melon of meekness. Beloved, there are a variety of melons in nature. There are watermelons, one of my favorite, favorite fruit. And I know many of you love it too. And I can look at some, no, we're not cutting it. Uh, some of you now, uh, I can see uh, you're licking your lips as uh, the, you, your mouth is beginning to water for this watermelon. But there are also cantaloupes and honeydews, etc. And they are all sweet and delicious. Amen. We love them. But you know what's interesting about melons is that they are ground fruit, which means that they bloom in the ground and not in a tree. So they aren't as visible as tree fruit. In the same way, meek Christians aren't as visible either. They are humble unassuming, and quiet, often low-key. They are the opposite of prideful, arrogant, egotistical, and stubborn. They never thirst after the attention and praise of men. Another thing about the melon is that it's tough. It's a tough fruit. It is encased in a hard shell instead of a thin skin like other fruit. In the same way, meek Christians possess a smile, sweet spirit, but a tough out of shell, which means they may be humble, but they're tough. They may be quiet, but they are strong. They're especially tough and strong against evil. Meek Christians have four interesting characteristics about them. They are strong. They are teachable, they are considerate, and yes, they are beautiful. And I want to demonstrate these characteristics to you from the scriptures. In fact, meekness is one of the pieces of fruit in God's spiritual fruit basket located in this fifth chapter of Galatians, verse 22. I call it the melon of meekness. Uh, now, meekness is the eighth of nine pieces of fr fruit mentioned in the basket. Now, the King James uh, translation refers to it as gentleness. In fact, uh, some illustrations will have both words, meekness slash gentleness, together. Other translations will actually call it meekness. I prefer meekness, the meekness translation, because it goes good with melons, one of my favorite food. So let me now examine the four characteristics of the melon of meekness. First, the first characteristic is that meek Christians are strong Christians. 
Let me say it again. Meek Christians are strong Christians. Now, there is a common belief shared by many people that a meek person is a weak person. I stopped by to tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. The Apostle Peter talks about the expectation for Christians to be able to restrain themselves whenever they are treated wrongly. He first talks about uh, being meek in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. He says this. He says, and you ought to write this verse down or go to the text in your Bible, but certainly you want to make a note of it. But in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, he says, All of you, all you born again, baptized, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, saved folk, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted, meek, be courteous. Now he's talking about first us being meek. Then he goes on in the verse and notice the next thing he says in verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessings. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like Jesus. It sounds like Jesus because it is. Peter is simply teaching Christians what Jesus has already taught the Jews. With both friend and foe alike, stay out of the retaliation business. If your enemy strikes you on one street cheek, give him the other. Now, now don't get what Jesus is teaching twisted. He wasn't talking about allowing folk to beat you down, stomp you, kick you, pick you up, put you back down, and stomp you some more. He's not talking about sitting there and accepting abuse. If you are married in a marriage situation and somebody is abusing you, you are not to sit there and take that abuse. Get out. Don't kill them. Get out. What Jesus is saying is that when people hurt you, when people mistreat you, don't go J.R. Ewing on them or Erica Kane on them. You all remember J.R.? J.R. was a bad boy. He would, uh, he would plot and manipulate. He would start that thing at the beginning of the season, and by the end of the season, he has tore up everybody. Erica was the same way. Don't be vengeful. There's a difference with uh, turning the other cheek and being vengeful. But it takes a strong man or a strong woman not to return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. And reviling means insult for insult. It's a dangerous thing, too, as well, because do you not know people have gotten killed by playing the dozen? You know, your mama is so fat and all of that, and you come back, your mama is so and all that. People get killed for that kind of stuff. It takes a strong man not to retaliate, but it didn't take, but it didn't take much strength uh, to do the other stuff. It takes strength and courage and poise uh, not to go off on somebody not to get ghetto on them, not to take off your earrings. And many of us have taken off many a pair of earrings. Anybody can do that. But it takes great strength, great discipline, great poise, and great courage to hold your peace or restrain yourself from striking back after you've been struck. I'm reminded of an old uh, uh, 1970s television show called Kung Fu. And the star of the show was a fellow by the name of Kwa Chang Kang. And Kang was a Shaolin uh, monk or priest, and he was on a search or mission to find his half-brother. And he was going through the old American West. He was meek and mild. He never said much. In fact, you would look at him and think maybe he was off in the head. But, 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 but you didn't push Cain. You didn't mistreat him and you, you didn't uh, act unjustly against him or others because once you came at him, immediately he would come out with the kung fu. Cain would beat up five people and never break a sweat. Same thing with Walker, Texas Ranger. Walker, Walker was quiet, wasn't he? Just nice and, and calm. But then all of a sudden, Walker would beat 20 men up 
and his hat would never come off his head. Meek, mild, but strong. Woo! Meek Christians are strong Christians. Secondly, meek Christians are teachable Christians. Book of James, chapter 1, verse 21. Make note of it. Notice what it says. It says, lay aside all filthiness and all overflow of wickedness. And watch this. And receive with meekness. Receive. You can't receive anything when you're not meek. You're hard-headed. Nothing can get through because you're not meek. You're arrogant. You're prideful. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. In other words, walk in meekness so that you can receive God's word and become teachable. Now, have you ever encountered people that no matter what you try to tell them, they refuse to listen to you? And, and, and you have to say like the old folk or like our mama and dad used to say about, can't tell them nothing. Can't tell him nothing. Oh, God, can't tell him nothing. We still have people in our family. Can't tell him nothing. That stubborn, prideful, know-it-all spirit has made them both hard-headed and hard-hearted. Therefore, they are unteachable. And let me just say this. As pastor, I have also encountered Christians who refuse to be taught the scriptures due to apathy. They refuse to attend Sunday school, Bible study, primarily because they don't care to. Why do I need that? I'm fine like I am. I don't need to study. I sit at home and study my Bible, and you know you're not doing it. Oh, it's tight, but it's right. How can you be a child of God but refuse to avail yourself to the study of God's word? There is a contradiction here. Your apathy has overshadowed your meekness and your desire to learn. But when a person is meek, he is not like that. He is teachable. Meek Christians are teachable Christians. They refuse to be satisfied with their ignorance. Thirdly, meek Christians are considerate people. In other words, it's not enough to be saved, sanctified believers in Christ, and to treat folk like dirt. Doesn't fit. Doesn't work. Doesn't belong here. And those of us who think differently, you need to have your Christian credentials examined because something is wrong. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul from the fourth chapter of Ephesians, verses 1 and 2. Let me add on verse 1. Walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and patience, bearing with one another in love, not hate. When we are considerate of others, it means we are concerned for their welfare as well as our own. With some folk, there are only three people in the world, me, myself, and I. Meekness says that's not right. There are more folk in this world than me, myself, and I. There are others. It demands that we are considerate of others. It makes us consider what is best for the common good and not just our personal good. And we've got to learn as Christians the common good, the common good, doing things for other folk. It ain't always about you, yours, and mine. The common good the welfare of the entire church family, and not just your family. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. When we do that, when we look out for the interests of other folk and not just us, when we get rid of the me, myself, and I, Mentality, that's when the church is at its best. That's when growth takes place, both numerical as well as spiritual. We stifle our growth when we're selfish, when we're mean, when we're stingy, when we're inconsiderate, when we gossip, when we tear down everything we don't understand. And we are, we, are, we are ungrateful for those who do perform and do do things. 
thank God for a few good men and women in this church. For without them, you wouldn't have no church. And then some of you would have the audacity to complain about what they do. God help you. Fact of the matter is, you might need to be born again, period, if you have that kind of an attitude. That is what makes the church unattractive. That's what runs people off. Where they at? I don't know. Because somebody has hurt them. Somebody has said something to them. Somebody has been mean to them. Somebody says, you don't belong here. Who are you? Don't, I pray God don't give me a thunderbolt. Hmm. And consider this. When we are inconsiderate of our brother and our sister, then we demonstrate hatred toward them. And I tell you that if you have hatred in your heart for your brother, then you hate God too. The Bible is clear. How can we say we love God whom we have not seen and hate our brother whom we have seen? You can't do that. It is pure hypocrisy to shout on Sunday and gossip on Sunday evening. It's pretentious to drool over a man, and I say this all the time, I'll say it again. It's pretentious to drool over a man with a degree from Morehouse and to turn up your nose to a man with no house. And we can't pick and choose who we like and who we love either, especially when it comes to our children. I don't like this. This bothers me. Don't just love your child. Love all children. Don't just love your grandson. Love all the grandchildren. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red, yellow, black, and white, all are precious in his sight, Jesus loves the little children of the world because it takes a village to raise these babies. Too much hell in the world to try to get him up on your... You need, I need all the help I can get. Well, Reverend, if you try to tell some kids, the parents come and beat up a... I understand that. We might have to have a conversation. Listen here. You're going to have to have some tr help with your child. I know some of us think our children walk on water. They do not. I'm going to tell you the truth. They don't. Fact of the matter is some of our kids are bad. Some of us have raised or put our baby children, and we got to do something to help you with them. Oh, you don't like me. But you got to recognize when you got a baby. He'll come back and he'll, he'll hurt you. He'll embarrass you. He'll make your life misery. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Me Christians are considerate of everyone. Finally, Me Christians are beautiful people. Beautiful people. Listen to what the Apostle Peter had to say about beautiful people in 1 Peter Chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. He says this. Do not let your adornment be merely outward. Arranging the hair. <laughs> he knew nothing about weave or any of that. Wearing gold or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart. With the incorruptible beauty of a meek and quiet spirit. I like that. The inner beauty of, of a meek and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Do you not know that a ton of money is spent in this country every year on beauty aids? Sure you do. Beauty shops everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's hair. Pedicures and what, what, what are these called? These are, oh, <laughs> the pedicure is for the feet and the manicure for the hand. And I heard now that with some folk feet, uh, you have to have, use a sanding machine to really get in there. <laughs> yes, you do. 
And you know you do. A ton of money is spent. Trillions of dollars are spent on cosmetics, jewelry, clothing, plastic surgery, body sculpting. The two fellas, the two plastic surgeons in Atlanta making tons of money. Folk come in there and tummy tucks, belly reductions, and this and that. Some folk are having their feet turned the other direction. <laughs> Trillions of dollars. And people do this because they want to be beautiful. But what many of them fail to realize is that true beauty is not found on the outside. It is found on the inside. Some people are like flowers in a pot. On the outside, they display the beauty of the flower. But on the inside is the blackness of the dirt. It doesn't do us any good to, to have a cute weave of hair on our head and have an ugly attitude inside our head. A pair of earrings can't compensate for an arrogant spirit. And the most expensive lipstick can't cover up a disrespectful tongue. You think you're fine on the outside, but on the inside, you're dirty, you're ugly, you're mean, you're the Grinch. You might look, you might be Coca-Cola bottle fine on the inside, but on the inside. Reverend Peter says, if you want to be beautiful, especially in the sight of God, be meek. There is nothing prettier. Nothing lovelier, nothing more attractive, nothing more beautiful than a meek and quiet spirit. And I want to ask you this question. Have you ever been in the presence of a person like that? I tell you, there are few things more pleasant and wonderful than to be in the presence of a person with a meek and quiet spirit. I don't know because I married one. So let the word go forth to both friend and foe alike. And let there be no doubt that the meekness, that meekness is not weakness. For meek Christians are strong and courageous. Meek Christians are teachable, guided by God's wisdom. Meek Christians are considerate of others, concerned about the welfare and needs of others above their own. Meek Christians are beautiful. They possess a lovely and quiet spirit that attract everyone that is around. People like these are my heroes. Some folk admire Trump. Some people look up to prideful men. Some people worship folk with money. Others bow down to the entertainer like Beyonce and Jay-Z. It's your call, but it's up to me. I'd rather look up to Jesus. Why? Because he was meek and he was mild. And he possessed a quiet spirit about him. A quiet strength. For it was Jesus who was buked and scorned and talked about as sure as you were born. But he was strong enough not to complain. It was Jesus who was led from judgment hall to judgment hall. Falsely accused of crimes that he never committed. But he was strong enough not to say a mumbling word. It was Jesus who was hung high and stretched wide. But he was strong enough to refuse to come down from the cross. Or he could have called and dispatched a legion of angels, but he decided to die. His meekness was his strength, and it held him to the tree. And because he did these things, we have a right to the tree of life. We have a home in glory. We have a friend that sticks closer than any brother. We have a Savior who defeated death, busted out of hell, and beat down the devil. He didn't do it with his pride. He didn't do it with arrogance. He didn't do it with an ego. He did it with his meekness. I stopped by to tell you today that there's great power in a meek man. There's great strength in a meek woman. There's great dignity in a humble soul. There is great beauty in a quiet spirit. Arrogance will be destroyed. A haughty man will be humbled. But the meek, Jesus said, will one day inherit the earth. You want to know what that means? 
it means that one of these old days, I'm going to sit right by Jesus, and I'm going to be in a place of primary position. He's going to give me some rulership in his kingdom. You might not know anything about me on this side, but on the other side, when he comes again, I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to reign where Jesus reigns. I'm going to rule uh, where Jesus rule. Uh, I'm going to praise my Savior all the days of my life. Uh, I wasn't named who's who at my school. Uh, I wasn't the most prettiest guy. I wasn't the smartest. Uh, I wasn't the greatest athlete. Uh, I don't drive a big car, uh, and I'm not on television, uh, but that's all right. Uh, because one of these days, I'm going to reign with my Savior. You may not have heard of me on this side, but I stopped by to tell you that I know a man who knows all about me. Before I was born, he knew me. Before I was formed in my mama's womb, he knew my name uh, before I showed up uh, at 1813 uh, Wilcox Boulevard. Uh, I lived on Holy Ghost Avenue uh, up in God's heaven. Uh, one of these old days, I'm on my way uh, back to glory. I can see it now when I get there. Uh, when I get to the gate, uh, the announcement will be made. Uh, there's a fella at the gate. He belongs to Jesus. The word will go out. Let him in. And I'm going to come in. I'm going to strut down the streets of gold. I'm going to hold my chest up. Hold my head up. The heavenly choir going to stand and give me a standing ovation. I was a nobody down here. But up there, I'm going to be somebody. Yes, I am. Walk on streets of gold. Yes, I am. I got a robe with my name on it. I got a crown to put on my head. Golden slippers put on my feet. After a while, by and by, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. But I know I'm somebody in the sight of God. Meek and humble in this land. Don't have much, but I know I'm a child of the king. I'm somebody, yeah, yes I am. I wonder today, are you willing, are you willing to humble yourself? Get down on your knees, bow your head, raise your hand, Father, Father, I stretch my hand to thee, no other help, I know, help me Lord, help me Lord, I've been down, I've been slapped, talked about, looked down upon, belittled, never thought I'd be anybody but I am yes I am yes I am come on here choir <laughs> 